to um, really develop and empower and, and work alongside both some of the trade unions that supported us. We got tremendous support from a number of locals in Seattle, um, both um, with resources and also just championing the, the, the demand as well. Um, the Woofsey Washington Federal State Employees Union, the AFSCME local, they organized um, a number of custodial workers at the University of Washington. And really, um, we, through our movement and building up even around fast food workers, uh, helped give them the confidence. They're now asking for $15 as the base minimum wage in all of their contract negotiations starting this fall. And we've, we've participated in many of their, their picket actions and all of this. You know, they sought the support of the movement at the same time we sought support of the union. And I think you know, we can take a lot of lessons from the way that they're doing organizing here, really, and trying to get um, the youth involved, I think, in, in making sure that they're represented within the unions. But um, this is, a, this is a, an issue that is also, um, you know, a lot of women, uh, are, the majority of low-wage workers in the U.S. are also women, and predominantly women of color. So this is a, a broadly spanning movement, I think, that as much as we can grow from the victory in Seattle to grow it nationally, we'll both, I think, protect the wins, what we've gained there, but also be able to fight for even more. Um, there's an initiative in San Francisco that is more strongly backed by some of the larger labor unions there. Um, the SEIU Local 1021 has been um, doing a lot more on the ground organizing and sort of agitating around the demand. And fundamentally, if, if some of the larger trade unions had backed us in Seattle, we would have had an even stronger proposal. And I think that that's, it's huge to see when we have um, unions like the Bakers Union really coming out in support of a very bold demand and willing to do the organizing necessary on it. But um, I think it's, it's uh, Shama will also be um, here in November for the November 8th Socialism 2014 conference, and I would urge anyone um, able to attend to really get an opportunity to hear how she's using what I think is fundamentally um, a position that is not always, you know, especially in the U.S., one that's not really welcome to a socialist voice, but it's, I think, indif indicative of a real openness to both um, a grassroots organizing strategy that, um, you know, hasn't really been tried in recent years in the same way. You know, we're really pushing that the strategy is the lesson that comes out of Seattle and um, that being tied to both the victory that Shama had with the 93,000 votes. 93,000 people in Seattle voted for a socialist mm -hmm. in the first time in over 100 years in the U.S., you know, in this way. It's really, I think, um, fundamental to giving that voice to the movement and really building up from there. And, you know, we need to be running similar initiatives, I think, on these types of um, campaigns across the country. So it's really huge. On the, on the fast food campaign itself, where's that got to now? You know, it's, um, it, it's been building over several years. And um, with the, you know, it's been predominantly the one-day strike actions. Yeah. And I think um, what was mentioned about the franchises, yeah. um, I think it's, this, it's, it's one of the, I think, first sort of big business using small business arguments. You know, they, they really push small business out in front to kind of fight their battles. You don't see the McDonald's CEO at the table arguing that they don't want to pay their workers more. You see them pushing their franchisees out in front to say, oh, well, you're going to put us out of business. The thing is, you know, uh, McDonald's Subway, we ran into the Subway franchisees mm -hmm. um, talking in Seattle about how they were all going to go out of business. Um, everything about their stores is coming from the HQ, you know, it all comes, it's all standardized, even how many of the employees they have, how many people they're able to hire, is based on the sort of model of what Same. the corporate puts together. Yeah. So it's absolutely the corporate just trying to put out in front, you know, um, business people who are, who really have the business of, of, you know, the sandwich shops and the names and you know, they get the marketing strategy, all of that. It's, it's, a, it's a really insidious way, I think, of, of sort of trying to push forward and, you know, uh, throw fast food workers under the bus. We were showing the video last month, wasn't it, from the States, where even some of the civil, uh, the, the older civil rights campaigners were actually behind the campaign mm -hmm. and speak as a civil rights campaign as well, which was staggering. Absolutely. Yeah, no, again, it, it really, it's um, a lot of the, the true face of who's working in fast mm -hmm. food in these days in the U.S. is not one of the teenager from the 1950s just looking for pocket change. It even, I think, links up with student debt. A lot of... Um, young people are trying to get jobs so that they can, you know, pay for college and maybe not come out so far behind. You know, if it's the next sort of speculative bubble, bubble speculative market in the U.S., I think it'll really make a difference. If if they're trying to cut 
um, especially how many young people end up um, contributing to their family wages, you know, contributing to their whole household income. It makes a huge difference. And I think people are really, income inequality has been put on the political agenda in the US like it hasn't been in recent years. But the, again, the main lesson is how much I think people need to kind of cross industry and, and sort of cross age group really need to, to band together as you know working class people and really fight on this issue and support in a mobilized grassroots way the fast food workers who are stepping out. The more community support there is, I think the more difficult it will be for McDonald's to claim that they can't do it and for the bosses to then fire people. <coughs> Where does the campaign go next? Well, I think first of all, uh, what an inspiration. I mean, if, if anyone thinks that it's impossible to get, you know, you know, real rights for workers in the fast food industry in the UK, then in the belly of the beast, you know, in you know the leader of world capitalism, let's be clear about it. To get a victory like this is just incredible, and I think it has been an inspiration to us. But I mean, for the National Shop Stewards Network point of view, we'd like there to be involved in the fast food race campaign to work alongside yourself, John, and Baker's Union, and our allies, really, in this uh, campaign. And of course, there are different strands, but it is about organizing into a trade union. Look, you're in a trade union, you get better terms and conditions. You tend to get better pay. You get better hours at work. You get better benefits. That's the reality of it. That's the benefit of being in a trade union. If, if that wasn't the case, why does the government want to curtail trade union rights? Why are they talking now about uh, bringing more anti-trade union legislation in? Because they know the situation as well. And therefore, the more workers we get organised in the trade union, the better. I mean, I know you've been involved in this campaign as well, John, but yesterday, the day after, you know, we had 300 union reps and shop stewards at our conference on Saturday, very good. But yesterday, I went down a picket line in Brixton, the Ritzy uh, Cinema campaign, uh, and it was very much as you've described it. Uh, these are, I'd say, professional, uh, you know, workers in a way. You know, these are workers who are graduates, uh, and they're fighting for a living wage. You know, uh, which in London is what eight pound eighty, I think it is, or something uh, like that. Uh, you know, we'd have to. You know, that's why I think the ten pound an hour demand is because it's estimated in Britain they're under eleven pound an hour. In effect, low wages being subsidised because of the housing benefit, other benefits that have got to be worked. But those workers are in the union, uh, they're organised and they're taking the action. I just want to plug on their behalf that they've launched now a boycott of picture house cinemas mm -hmm. and they've got a march on yeah. the 17th uh, of July and you know, obviously we need to give them full back in. So I just make this point as well is that I think trade unions have got a huge role to play at the moment. And on Thursday, you know, we've got the national strike of public sector workers for a pay rise, and with the firefighters defending their pension rights. But I think all this has got to be married up, you know. Though, you know, I, I think on Thursday, the trade union movement, just like it did on November 30th, 2011, is going to show everyone in this country what a force it is. But there must be hundreds of thousands of workers in fast food, outlets or other low wage uh, uh, employers who are going to look at the trade union movement, they're going to be attracted to the trade union movement and I hope that we get a, the fast food rights get a spin off from mm. that and those people uh, join the trade union. So that's why I think the campaign is a very, very positive uh, campaign. So you say coordinating the action on Thursday. Ronnie, you're taking a resolution to the TUC on the 10 pound minimum wage. We're, we're, we're taking two motions, John, to the, the TUC. I, I think one thing about being a small union is I think you have to target what you're going to do. And we, we can't do everything that the big unions can. We just don't have the resources to do it. So what we do, we tend to put motions be, before the TUC that we think are winnable, things that are going to uh, very much appeal to people, not just from a rhetorical point of view, it's actually going to appeal and, and have benefit to people's lives. And this year, the two motions we put forward, one is the, you know, the call for a £10 an hour minimum wage, which I think that lots and lots of people can hang their, their, their coat on. When I was saying before about you know, people going in and write, or writing to McDonald's and writing to these companies and you know, sort of castigating for the way they exploit people, there's a major role for the trade union to, to play. The trade union movement. So when we come on the, uh, you know, in September the seventh or whenever this motion gets moved, is that unions put their hands up, not just put their hands up in a hall to say, yeah, let, let's appease somebody, let's put our hands up and let's actually go out and do something about it. 
make sure it's on every single wage application that we put in that we go for ten pound an hour. And the more that we can drive that forward, the more likelihood we've got of getting these companies to turn, you know, to turn the tank around and start paying people decent wages. And the second one, John, that we're putting in is on zero hour contracts. Yeah. We're going to make sure there's a meaningful contract there and a meaningful debate that's going to take place because hopefully we're in the last few months of a Tory government. But what we've got to do is concentrate the, the mind of a Labour government that's coming in. I mean, we, you know, I've got to say, from, from my union's perspective, we do. We are one of the ones who do affiliate to the Labour Party, but what we're not after is another shade of blue, just a little bit lighter. We're not after light touch austerity. We want a Labour Party that comes in and represents people. I mean, they, one of the things that they, they should be doing is making statements on the exploitation of, of these young people. It is absolutely horrendous. We're not even talking, incidentally, about these people getting uh, the minimum wage. Because of their age, all these people are being exploited way below. They're not, there's no 631 for them. We're talking on menial amounts of money. You know, and I think somebody said at the National Shop Stewards meeting on Saturday about there's always too much month left at the end of the money. You know, these people wouldn't even get past the first week of a month with you know the, the the wages that they're being uh, they're being paid, and for the flexibility, and it is the utmost flexibility that they're given to to uh, these companies. I would use an example. I think the thing that really got me interested. There was a young mother who lived down the road from me when I lived in the northwest, and she was a a manager of McDonald's, and she got called in at eleven o'clock because somebody hadn't turned up in the ship because she was the deputy manager. Mm -hmm. She got called in at eleven. She had two young children. One was a baby, and one a young kid. And uh, she got called in and told she had to come in. If she didn't come in, she was going to be disciplined. Mm -hmm. That's all because somebody else hadn't turned. And that is the sort of utmost, you know, the utter contempt that these companies treat mm -hmm. young people because they know. There's always somebody that, that's going to come. Whilst the government keeps this pool of unemployed young people, you know, we, we, we go mad about there being a million people, a million young people unemployed. The government want that because they can drive down wages. You know, there's a steady stream of people just to fill in on, on jobs. And we've got to make sure that an incoming Labour government commits to doing something from day one on, on, on the, this exploitation, make sure it stops. And that's why we're putting our motions forward, John, to the TUC. And we will be pushing other unions to join our campaign. You know, success has many fathers, everyone will claim the victory in this. At the end of the day, I know which union started the campaign and I know the other organisations who, who banded with us to make sure that we did it. And we, you know, that history will show that. But the fact is, at the end of the day, it's not about gaining fame. It's about, you know, getting rid of this, this exploitation that's going on. The unions are that, that are back with £10 so far, GMB. Yeah, we know the GMB and I know there was a big discussion at United Conference actually uh, Helen was a youth observer at that conference last week and there was a speaker, the GMB sent someone along on uh, Saturday to the NSSN conference. So I think there's a big potential here for a real broad there's momentum front on this. You know, it's a legitimate demand now, you know. I think people, on, when, we, when we've been on the McDonald's campaign and the Costa campaign, people have been wanting a fairly straightforward demand, haven't they? When you talk to people, they need to know what a, a simple demand is. That's why the 15 is so popular, mm -hmm. and the 10, 10 is here. I was shocked on the zero hours contract stuff. Even I was shocked mm -hmm. at how intimidation was used on the zero hours contracts. Talking to some of the workers that we did about, you know, if they did go anywhere near a union or anything like that, very difficult to prove the threat had taken place. But if they went near a union, they wouldn't get what I was next week and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It's interesting how that's been used. I remember that Costa worker, Costa denied, but the Costa worker who turned up at our first meeting, we said he hadn't smiled enough that day, so he didn't mm. get any hours the following week. Oh, smiled smiled enough. Yeah. Remember that? Oh, yeah. That was the first yeah. meeting. And uh, those are, you know, quite common stories that we get coming in, uh, people saying how they've been treated, how if they asked for a break, that was me definitely, if I asked for a break, then the next week I'll get less hours. And I think the whole point of all the campaign parts of the campaign that we're running is that until we abolish Gerard's contracts, until we win £10 an hour, then young workers can't have the other rights that they deserve at work to a decent uh, uh, working life, to a break, uh, to you know not being bullied. Because whilst you're on a zero hours contract, you know you essentially don't have those rights. You know essentially you can be bullied, and you're you know you're so flexible because it's all for the employer and nothing for you. That, uh, that 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 a lot of things uh, and a lot of things that really shouldn't be happening uh, are starting to creep back into the workplace, and people are continuing to become more and more exploited. And that's why we need ten pounds an hour, 
so that people aren't forced to work uh, 60, 70 hour weeks just to make sure that they've got enough to pay the bills and we need to scrap zero hours contracts so that people aren't uh, you know, going to bed each night worried, not knowing what they're going to have coming in at the end of the month. Uh, but the thing is, we can't leave it just to political parties to give us that. We do need organised trade unions and all the workplaces as well, because those are going to be the ones that uh, make sure that, uh, that that it's a demand that is for workers, and also that all these extra little things that are on top of £10 an hour and a, and a scrapping of zero hours contracts don't uh, continue tapping because ultimately it's always going to be an organised workforce that can stop bullying, can stop harassment, can stop uh, mistreatment as well as uh, making sure people have you know, flexibility on their terms and not on that on the employer but flexibility <coughs> that allows them to have the working lifestyle that they uh, want uh, that's positive for them and not just for uh, the owner of McDonald's who wants to make a quick book. And the other thing that we should plug is that our next day of action is the 28th of August that again will be marching up and down high streets, up and down the country, uh, protesting uh, McDonald's, uh, Burger King, KFC and Costa are always going to be on our list, but I'm sure there'll be other people who uh, want to protest at other places as well. Uh, places where we want a decent uh, job security, decent hours, decent pay, and to scrap uh, you know, bullying in the workplace and all those mistreatments as well. Where we're at in terms of we need a critical mass of workers within the shops themselves within, within the fast food restaurants themselves and that's where we're at at the moment trying to build that critical mass because then all the, we did a Skype we Skyped with a group of workers was it Washington I think it was at yeah. meetings and we Skyped and what came out of that was that it's the workers in the shops themselves who, who were able and brave enough and strong enough to be able to stand up in the in the restaurant and announce their action that's mm -hmm. we're not at that stage yet we're slowly building up a critical mass to enable us to do that but we're also using the American example as well, trying to get civil society organisations back in this. I think we had our first bishop, didn't we, right, right back in, in support. Uh, look, <laughs> allies anywhere. <laughs> if, it's, if it's from the pulpit, so much the better. It's trying to get as wide a range of support as we possibly can. But we're at those first stages, really. The TUC is important to us because we want to get the other unions as well yes. on board in terms of demand and supporting the demand and backing us up on the ground. Mm. Yeah. I think one, one problem we have got, though, is if you, if you look at the way legislation within this country is formed, yeah. I mean, we haven't got the protective legislation for, for workers that other countries have got. It is the, one of the easiest countries to get rid of workers. And at the same time, we've got a government that props up <coughs> landlords who want to charge extortionate rent. They, they support loan sharks like Wonga who want to use usurious rates. Mm -hmm. They, you know, ed education costs, you know, in, in, in academies, right across the whole thing, that it's all absolutely loaded against young people. So the, the energy prices, they won't legislate against energy companies. They allow them to, you know, the prices to soar. They won't legislate against transport companies. They allow the prices to soar. But they will leg put legislation in place that suppresses wages and makes it legal for companies to do it. And that's what we've got to change. It isn't even a vicious circle because it doesn't meet, it's just this never ending line of deprivation and exploitation of young people. And we've got to make sure that somewhere we break that link. That, you know, either we, we massively, you know, reduce energy and transport, all those sort of costs and food costs, and make sure that the subsidies for young people, or we, we give them a proper rise. We give them the ability to live with dignity within society and to do the things that maybe we've had the opportunity of doing in the past. We want the, our, you know, our, our children, our children's children, to have exactly the same opportunities that we've had in the past. Better opportunities, actually, we should be building. It's the first generation of people where the worst of them, what the parents were. It's a mixed workforce, interesting, in this country. But large numbers of young people, students and others, but young people haven't got a job and they go to this. But also, outside of London in particular, there's an yes. older age range, range as well. So, mm -hmm. like the states, you're talking about late 20s, early 30s, mm -hmm. who are in that sector, but there's not much alternative work. So, they're trapped in that sector as well. So, that it's a more of a, quite a mix, isn't it, in this country now that we're finding on the ground. Mm -hmm. And it's those who are, particularly those approaching towards young families, that are the ones that then become highly dependent on the job. We had a few examples of young mothers who are quite extensively exploited particularly around these hours you will work the hours we tell you there's no negotiation on that and you'll only be given these hours or you'll have to come at a certain time and the phone call goes on 
We've also had examples, we've talked about this before, about you know, people racing to, to work to get the hours as well, so they're competing against each other. It is stepping back to that standing line. It's, 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 it's the 1930s. It's a doctor, not COVID. You know, even, you're not even going back to the 30s, John. I mean, when I, I, when I lived in Liverpool, yeah. when I was a kid, you know, the UA, you had this, what they called, they called it the pool, didn't they? Yeah. And it was casualisation of labour, and they came out, and if you face fitted, you got a day's work or a night's work. But you may not be on the next day, and that was how it was. You, it was, it was, it was stripping dignity away from people, having people crowded into a pen. They called them not the bills of yeah. pen. They were in the pen, and they were picked when when they were needed. If not, but it was almost like an exclusivity deal because they had to stay there if they wanted to work. There was no one going to phone you up or come to your house. You had to be there if you wanted to work, mm -hmm. and you weren't guaranteed to get work when you got there. And you could be stood there for days on end. Mm -hmm. that, that's what they want. They want the dignity stripping out of employment for people. And we've got to make sure that we're the champions of making sure it doesn't happen. And the 21st century version of that is that uh, the example, which is in a video that the Bakers Union produced, that 20 workers are sat at home waiting for a text from their employer. They get a text of where the work is going to be. They have to race each other to the employment. Um, the first person there gets the job. Uh, but if the other 19 people don't turn up, then they're off the text list. They'll never be offered work again. You can see how it's exactly the same mechanism of forcing people to fight each other for a measly few pence, uh, mm -hmm. a race to the bottom. Uh, um, um, you know, just like it, just like it has been in the past. It's just in a different form, uh, suited up for the 21st century. I was, I was amazed that actually all the companies are following the same methods now. Mm -hmm. Text, text yeah. hours and all that sort of thing. My dad was a doctor, so it was exactly like that. And if the issue there is if you. Again, if you're acting as a trade unionist as well, you'd be, or ENC, you'd be, you'd tell you that blacklisting has gone on even to today. Mm -hmm. Showed that they put two fingers up to secondary picket, and they came out. Yeah. We had we had the community, the local community protesting. We had like youth fight for jobs, and you know the National Shop Students Network, and United Resist, all those organisations, all. You know, but to boycott uh, stuff. They were going out and collecting money for them. Uh, they were making sure that those 400 workers went starved back to work. But more importantly, they also attacked the brand. And that's what private enterprises are like. But the brand is king. And that's the same with McDonald's. And it's the same with Subway. The, the brand is king. They don't care about the people who work for them. Mm -hmm. And I, I suspect that was the same with Hovis. But the trade union movement demonstrated, and society with the right thinking demonstrated, that if you attack a brand like Hovis, you can win. I said before, you know, stick together, win together. That's what we, why Hovis won, because everybody all pulled in the same direction. And what we've got to do is learn the lessons from that. Not just put it, glorify it as a great victory. Mm -hmm. We've got to make sure that we actually use that as the template, template for the future and that people build on it. And you had a boycott products campaign. We, we had a boycott product, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we, and, I mean, you wouldn't believe the threats that were made. You know, not just the workers, you know, the likes of me, the company, you know. What the, you know, what they're going to do to me? You know, they're going to take my heart. They're going to, you know, sequestrate my money. You can do it. I, you know, I've got an extra wife who's trying to do that. You know what I mean? You know, you can join the queue, mate. <laughs> this is where other money comes into it. You, know, you had the town behind you as well, didn't you? Council, MPs. So Absolutely right fantastic. It was, you know, as I say, it was a coalition oh, okay. of like-minded people. You know, I mean, we, we won together. You know, and. You know, I mean, even down, down to the, the, the when the company phoned, I've been speaking to the People's Assembly in Dublin. The company phoned me in, when I was, Ian and I were in Dublin Airport, and the company phoned me to say, look, if you call off the dispute today, we'll give in. We'll, we'll give you every, all your demands. But it'll be on condition that, that me as an individual wrote a disclaimer that any other Hover site that, that wants to fight against zero hour contracts or the exploitation of agency labour, I would sign those right away. And I told the company to get stuffed. Mm -hmm. And three minutes later, the company were back on saying, okay, you've got a deal, just, just go ahead. Mm -hmm. Now what we've got to do is make sure those other branches do the same if it, if it happens. And we call on the same people to, to support them. You've had city administrations, haven't you? Kind of fair yeah, fair. yeah. Well, I think that that's exactly it. Like, um, if, if it doesn't grow, how do you protect what you've won you know, yeah. at a certain point? And I think that's, that's essentially the direction we're going now with um, 15 Now, really trying to grow it into a national campaign. We had had a national conference in the end of April with uh, 15 states represented, um, people from around the country, um, and over 450 folks present. Um, and really, it was about, you know, what's the organizing model, and how do we how do we grow this and replicate it, and how can we 
can we turn this into more of a mass movement and really show that the point to Seattle is the inspiration. But again, it's, it's absolutely how can you build up in a unified way the, the, enough pressure to really, um, you know, sort of force the hand of business at a certain point and, um, you know, really, you know, show who's standing behind these workers, you know. And um, I think going back to something that Ron said before, um, it was, um, you know, with McDonald's, in the U.S., um, they their workers receive uh, around six billion dollars a year in um, social security benefits and subsidies from the government. So, you know, we as, as public taxpayers in the U.S. are, are subsidizing the corporate profits of McDonald's and other companies like this. You know, and um, I think in a really fine example um, as well in Seattle um, is not exactly the same thing, but not long after. Within days, when the council had voted on the $15 minimum wage proposal, um, very quietly there was slipped in this um, proposal for a $100,000 pay raise to the already highest city paid employee, already highest paid city employee um, in Seattle, uh, the head of the City Lights Company, which is the municipally owned um, energy company. So the, the, the city council within two days, you know, it's like you'd think, what, what have you learned out of this process? You know, we've been debating how to get the lowest paid workers, you know, $3 billion over 10 years is being moved in Seattle from business into the pockets of workers. But we've been debating this for several months and you're gonna try and turn around within two days time and award the highest paid city employee a $100,000 pay raise, you know? And I think it was really, it was, um, didn't seem like to some people they didn't think it was directly related to the minimum wage issue, but we were like, look, you know, right. this is exactly what will happen if you don't not only have the pressure of um, a council person like Shum Sawant who's going to fight with it or expose that this sort of thing is being brought to the council table, but then you know pressure on the outside. We we um, publicized it widely. We um, went you know in and um, protested at the offices, and um, the mayor ended up reversing the decision, and they didn't award the um, pay increase in the end, you know? And I think this is, it doesn't seem like it's directly related to something like, you know, a fast food worker struggle, but the thing is, we need to hold these, these uh, scenarios and these politicians, I think, to account in these respects. And in the US, I think it's a huge part of the struggle to really expose where there's attempts to really increase the money that's in the pockets of the 1% in this way. And the unions are, the, the unions are focused on the company AGMs as well. Mm -hmm. And raising yeah. the issues there for shareholders. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Well, just following on a bit from, um, from the question of public support, that I mean, it does seem in the last year and a half, two years, there's been a growing awareness, not just in America and Britain, but around the world, on the issue of uh, on the issue of income inequality and, and low pay. So, as of, you know, what's the panel's take on why you know why it's happened now, why it's coming forward now, uh, and then building on that, then is your take on well, how we how we can sort of channel that public support into our campaign and how, how obviously how you do it in America as well. I think what's interesting is that when you go through a recession, all the examples are in the depths of the recession is when actually there's most probably the least political activity um, because people are just trying to survive. And it's as people emerge from a recession and they're not gaining the benefits of it or they're seeing the benefits distributed so unfairly, that's when people feel a little bit more confident about placing demands and become mobilised. It was very similar in the 30s as well. You had the hunger marches when it was at its worst, but the real mobilizations came after that. And I think that's the sort of phase we're in at the moment, where there's a sense of real injustice and un unfairness about what's happening. And you are seeing that gap. You know, we've had similar sort of waging salary <coughs> increases, et cetera, particularly once in You even have companies like WPP and Martin Sorrell that is having shareholder revolts. We've never seen before in companies that He's controlled where they're actually challenging shareholders, challenging the increases that the, the directors and, and the chief execs are having. So I think there's that sense of unfairness that, that's built over the, the recent period. And people are, are pretty angry. And I, I think the problem that we have is that, and in this campaign, is that we're trying to mobilize the people who are the least secure and the hardest hit uh, in terms of when it comes to employment and, and wages. But, and that's why a lot of the initiative has had initially to come from outside the, the workers' groups themselves. Although we've recruited and we're attracting people, it's meant that there needs an increasing amount of support from people outside who are able to go on the demonstrations, help on the recruitment. And that's why having the bakers as the union leading on this is quite significant, because you've got a stable union recruiting in, in other shops along the high street like Greg's, etc. So it becomes a natural extension of their work. 
but it will need, I think, to get the momentum going, it will need quite significant support from other unions coming in behind when we have the demonstrations and when we're holding meetings, etc. So I think the, the potential is really there. That's why this TUC is quite important, to have that debate. And I think some of the representatives from the major unions that have come across in the States mm -hmm. over the last few, well, the last month or so, have been quite inspirational in just doing how we get the nitty gritty of the work done, mm -hmm. and how, how we build it that way. And these are really concerns for people. Mm -hmm. It isn't going to happen overnight anyway. We've only been going in this country now for what, five months since one. Well, I, well, I think on that, John, I mean, when Ronnie correctly talked about the dockers, and let's not forget, at one stage, there wasn't a dockers union. Yeah. You know, the dockers, yeah. the dock strike in 1889 in London, just along the Thames there, you know, that year, those, those years, 1888, 1889, some really historic uh, industrial battles like the Matchstick, the uh, right, Match yeah. Girls, the Dock Strike, Silvertown. You know, we had new unionism, we had the new creation of mass unions as mass mm -hmm. organisations. Well, we've got an element, you know, in a wrong little way, there's an element of what we are trying to create is new unions in a way, but not new unions, but trying to attract a new layer of people to trade unions. And I think, you know, we can do that, you know. And the problem with unions is, is you know, we, it's not a, a one-off, you know, it's not like one day and that's the end of it. It's patient, tenacious mm -hmm. uh, work, but I think it can be done. But I think the big advantage for us is, is that I think you're right, I think there's a feeling out there of whose recovery is this. We, mm -hmm. we constant, workers are constantly being told there's a recovery. And I think that's one of the reasons why there's a strike on Thursday, because how many of those public sector workers are saying to each other, well, where's my recovery? You know, I've had a pay freeze going on for years. Someone else is gaining it. I mean, the story in the media about the uh, the fundraiser, the Cameron had a handful of people worth collectively eleven billion pound. It's just mm -hmm. astonishing. Uh, and I, and I think, you know, if there is an up, you know, you know, I think there is a feeling amongst the, uh, you know, a large amount of workers. We've got a fight. You know, payday loan companies, food banks, all the rest of it. I mean. The, the, the rocket in rents as well that, uh, that are facing people. And I think that is a big chance for us, you know, because I, I firmly believe that uh, Thursday is not just going to be a, an incredible strike, it's going to be a mobilization of people. I think in every town and city there are going to be protest strike rallies, and some of the people attracted around those are going to be people who don't really know what a trade union is. They're going to have a hell of an education. And I think uh, another baker's union is not a public sector union, but I'm confident that we, you know, the, we've done an investment that we over the last few months go into these places. We might get a, we might, uh, you know, uh, knock on from that. Exactly, harvest something out of that. So, you know, what we are doing is pioneering work. You know, obviously supporting the baker's union with others, but it's work that we're not going to turn away from. And, mm. and that's the message we need to, to send the employers: is that. Mm. This, these aren't one-offs, mm -hmm. you know, no. we're not going away. This is about organizing fast food workers, the most vulnerable, not just in the fast food sector, but in all these sectors, you know, we are going to be targeting those employers and we're going to be organizing your workers. And then they're going to be coming to you, like they are in the Pictures, like they are in a lot of these other places, and demanding things that are only right, decent wage, mm -hmm. decent hours, terms and conditions, a regular job, regular income. Things that we thought, battles we thought had been won years ago, we're going to have to win them over again, but that's what we're going to do. I mean, we're not, we're not growing. I mean, I don't believe there is the recovery that everyone's saying. Look, no. I mean, the fact is that over the last six years, the, the, the population has grown by almost four million people. You've got to feed more people, you've got to transport more people. So you, there's got to be a natural growth within an economy anyway. Otherwise, it'd end up like a Michael Jackson video. We'd have four million transient people all walking around looking for work. You know, it'd be absolutely crazy. So it isn't the growth that they're saying. The, the, the rich have done very well at this, this austerity. Yes. Believe me, they've done very, very well. And we see by how much their capital's grown. But as, as far as I answer the question about what we, we, we were debating this on our parliamentary group. And again, we, we focus on the things that we believe are about what society wants, about how we, how, how you engender change. If it was about celebrity, then we'd have picked something that was going to be far easier for us to do. And if we thought it was about gaining wealth and getting millions of members, we'd have, we'd have looked at somewhere else. Because when, it isn't going to be massive membership growth, unless all of a sudden there's a realisation 
join a bakers union, it's absolutely fantastic and, and everyone comes along. And then we might have a nice problem and we service all those people. But the fact is, I'd love to have that problem. But it was never about gaining celebrity. It was about looking at what we've gone through with austerity, with the, you know, what happened with the banks, that, that was, you know, what they did to the country. And then look at who was suffering the most in society. And it, was, it, it wasn't the old, it wasn't the people who were in work. By and large, people in the middle class have probably gone through relatively untouched. You know, there'll be, there'll be some changes to them. But young people have been absolutely hammered. The, the, both those in work and those at work. The ones in work have seen what is it, a 12% 12, 12 decrease in their earnings over the last five years. That's absolutely heinous. How can you do that to the, the lowest paid sector within, within society? I think we might have that, so there's my point. I'm just thinking of, about, you know, what Rob was saying. In, in 12 months' time, we might have a late, might have a late government. Mm -hmm. Nothing certain about that, but might do. What kind of pressure, and the bakers is a Labour affiliated union, what kind of pressure can we build on the Labour Party to make further movements on pay? It's, it's talking about creating jobs for young people, these kind of compulsory youth jobs guarantee or, or whatever it is, but they are minimum wage jobs. You know, so jobs below even a, a living wage, let alone ten pound an hour, and also presumably with the threat of sanctions behind that, if people don't, um, you know, uh, if for whatever reason people end up, you know, finding that they're exploited at work and and hating hating those placements. What what can we do? And also, Labour is committed to a um, the, the public sector pay freeze. In the in the, the first year of, of Labour government, anyway. So what what can we do to try to influence Labour Party policy to, to to address the problem of pay, which people you know there's increasing levels of awareness now that that pay is a major problem, and that working the, the, the people in work are in poverty. Don't we need to demand more from the Labour Party? This is where Gramsci comes in, pessimism, the intellect, optimism, and the <laughs> will when it comes to the Labour Party. Um, I think it's about building the momentum, momentum more widely to do that. I don't think the Labour Party are convinced around anything like any ten pounds now at the moment, or a lot of rank and file they find that as well. Yeah. And I think they'll, the, the balls that on austerity will override all other all other demands that are coming up, at least in this early period. But there are all sorts of contradictions that are breaking out now, and this is what I'm a natural pessimist, but it's quite interesting. In the uh, over the weekend. Just take the stories over the weekend. We had the London Ambulance Service coming out with the fact that they're 600 paramedics short because they they can't recruit or retain paramedics in London, and the main problem is that they can't afford to live here. Right? It's, the contradiction there is, is if you're extremely rich in the city of London, you have a heart attack. The paramedic who comes with the paddles won't be there anymore because literally they can't recruit. The same with the midwives. Now, the midwives now talk about industrial action or whether yes. that comes up or not. Never known before. Now, again, you don't want to exaggerate that, but they're all reflections of, of the concrete reality of people not being able to afford to live on the wages that, that they're getting. So there's a, a, a momentum building, I think, around the whole issue of wages and making sure that there's a decent wage settlement in, in this, you know, these kind of negotiating rounds. We've never had the TUC for coordinate action in the way they have on this over a wage demand before. We had over pensions to a certain extent, but never over a wage demand. So the atmosphere, I think, is beginning to change. But in the run-up to a general election, the Labour Party, will, the Labour leadership, will be extremely cautious. One won't to give any hostages to fortune to the media on issues about associating themselves with trade union militancy, etc. So I think the shift won't come at the leadership level. It might well come as a result of the climate of opinion that builds up amongst the trade unions and the wider society and then among the rank and file of the Labour Party itself. And I think that's the best hope that we've got. It's, it's almost like an issue you have to confront at some stage because people are not going to let you avoid it. And I just, you know, every teacher I talk to in my constituency at the moment, I've never known morale to be so low. Part of, you know, part, you know there's an obsession with, with the um, wanting to garrot Michael Go, but at the same time, <laughs> it is around. It is around working extremely long hours, very committed, but at the same time not being able to afford to live within the area. Well, I mean, it's, I mean, I, I, I'm a firm believer. What we do is we go to our to back to our localities, our constituencies. We live. We, we talk to the people who want to elect, and we say, look here. I don't mean giving them a bill. 
And I mean, you know, we, we, these are our demands, and if you don't do it, we're not going to vote for you. But I think what we do do is common sense initiatives like what we're talking about now. We say, look, you know, we want a manifesto pledge on that. You don't want to do it. I mean, we know who the enemy is. We don't want to be fighting our own party. Let's, let, let's do something. And get away from this myth that George Osborne portrayed that, you know, the debt is bad. I mean, debt's not bad. Absolutely not bad at all. If you, if you look at that, I mean, if you've got, if you're a homeowner, you're in debt. You've got a mortgage, but at the end of the day, you have an asset. You have a house that's there. That is an asset. That's not proper debt. You know, um, companies who invest in plant machinery, at the end of the day, they still have an asset there. They have that plant and, and that machinery that is still there. I mean, and one of our employees who I'm going to meet on Thursday, uh, sorry, on Wednesday, is, is doing exactly that, you know, making a mint out of you know, the machinery. The banks haven't got any, any, anything behind them, but, but, you know, I've said it before in speeches, if we didn't finish paying for World War II until 2005, we were in debt all that time. And I've got to say, I, you know, from the 50s when I grew up, I never once heard anyone in the street where I lived or in the, in the group that I used to knock around with saying those bastards back in 1945 left us in a right mess and we're still paying for it now. <laughs> we just got on with it and we, and we cleared that debt. And okay, it took 60 years, but, you know, we built a welfare state out of that, didn't we? All the things that good happened in the time when we were left with the debt, and we paid it off. So all this guff about, you know, it, it, you know, we can't leave future generations in debt. Why can't we? As long as it is manageable debt, as long as we know what the goal is to pay it off. I mean, everyone's putting pension funds in debt at the moment. We're still going to get pensions, aren't we? We've got to be upset. Yes. Not so far off. Uh, so, so, so I, I think we've got to have a, a, an adult um, dialogue with the leadership of the Labour Party. I get them to start thinking about you know where they came from and the people that they represent. You know, what, you know, all this abstaining and not voting against the government. We've had a Tory government in who's had a free ride. I mean, Labour MPs going out. I mean, I remember even when I went on that thing with Liam Byrne over it was at Kate Riley's thing when the, when, when he got up and said, "Oh, you're not very good. You know, it's not nice what you're doing." And then urged the Labour Party, uh, Labour uh, uh, MPs to abstain. Why can't we even if we lose, vote against the Conservatives? At least show hope the public what we what we mean as, as a Labour Party. It's interesting, they've just won in court again. Yeah. On yeah. that, they've won again. The next strikes, by the way, uh, we, should, we need to flag this up, but Unison have already named the 9th and 10th of September mm. as the next strike date. So I mean, yeah. I, th I think what we've got to do is create a new mainstream, haven't we? Is that the mainstream that most ordinary people support is, you know, people having a decent wage, you know, having a proper job, you know, having a decent education, against the privatisation of the health service, all these things. That's the, the mainstream that we've, that most people support and we've got to create and, and create the pressure because, I mean, Mike, you made the point about that the Labour leadership support the continuing pay freeze. Well, I tell you what, if that strike on July the 10th is as big as we all on this table hope it is, and that continues into the autumn and beyond, that is going to create some pressure. You know, and I, I firmly believe that the people we'll see on Thursday on those strike rallies are the people who have their you know, uh, disability benefit cut, the people who are on you, you know, the scandal of universal credit, the people who are on zero hour contracts. You know, those people can be one around the trade union movement, and and that'll be. Pretty, I remember last year when we saw the the huge movement in Turkey, and then we saw it. We've seen in Brazil. In a way, what that is doing is creating a is creating a new mainstream because people have to take account of that. The politicians have to take account of that, those uh, those movements, and I think that's what we have to do. And I and I think what the Bakers Union, John yourself, and the campaign and the fast food rights are doing, we have to make ten pound an hour minimum wage. We have to make uh, abolition of zero hour contracts, the mainstream, and, uh, and and make it a given. And I think, you know, for Ginger, you know, again, it's been great having it over, but I think what's been achieved in America, even if it hasn't been achieved everywhere and it's still a long way to go, 15 now is now a legitimate demand. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think that, you know, the standard of living of the majority in society is never based on this health of the economy, it's based on the health of the trade union movement and the willingness for people to get organised to stand up and fight together because you know the wins that we've seen uh, that have happened over the last few years have happened during an economic crisis 
But when people have gotten organised, no matter where that's been, if they've you know shouted loud enough and uh, got enough force behind them, then they've won. It doesn't matter if business says that they can't afford $15 an hour anymore. It's not about whether they can afford it or not. It's about whether young people can afford to not be on, mm. uh, to be on less than $15 uh, an hour, and they can't anymore. And so it's not about this, uh, whether the uh, you know Big Macs, uh, they can afford it at McDonald's. It's about whether we can afford to live on those uh, 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 standards of living and whether we're gonna get organized or not. And that's going to mean, you know, that dictates a lot of what happens in the rest of the economy and then in, in the parliament as well. If people are willing to stand up and say, we're not going to work for anything less than £10, then we can force their hands by getting organised and, you know, hopefully we'll be taking strike action at some point as fast food workers, but, you know, we we'll start that journey. But that's what's important, not whether the economy can afford uh, to pay us enough to live off. We had shifted victory in Seattle um, around the $15 minimum wage with a lot of support from local labor unions, but um, you know that was raising 100,000 plus workers out of poverty, just in Seattle alone. Yeah. And if we were talking about this, you know, the, the 7.25 federal minimum wage, you know, four pounds 23, mm -hmm. um, bringing that up to 15, you know, in the midst of a strong, I think, push within the trade union movement, yeah. um, really supporting this more broadly, I think it, it'd be unimaginable at this point, really, what we could mm -hmm. be doing. And this is after, within the US context, you know, decades of defeat within the trade union movements. Um, but we're starting to see gains, and I think that, um, again, probably the, the most accomplished thing out of Seattle, aside from the concrete victory of those raise in wages, um, is actually how confident we're seeing workers. And just the even, yes. And membership. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and just, just even within you know, the first month, really, mm -hmm. it's been barely over a month that um, it's actually been concretely achieved, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, the effects that will. I think you know, with the growth in New York City and Boston and po possible campaigns in Minneapolis mm -hmm. and the San Francisco even being stronger, Portland, Oregon, Davis, California, you know, this thing I think is really spreading like wildfire based on you know what type of confidence, how much workers are willing to fight for. Okay. Everyone look forward.